today I'm in Den Haag in uh, the Netherlands, Princess Laurentine uh, and Prince uh, Constantine of the Netherlands. They really, really saw through the restrictiveness of royalty to shine as humans in my eyes. Ooh, you've got people with a certain title who are normal. That is maybe why I'm kind of struggling with making it so special about us being normal people. It is only just a role, but people associate it with many more things. But the, the underlying important value is we're doing this for, for people. people. The government admitted and saying we were wrong mm. in profiling people and, and, and so on. So if the government then wants to solve the issue, for the people concerned, the government is the wrongdoer. All the little steps can be fine, but if the result is bad, then someone needs to be, you know, look at this and say, you know, oh, this we have to stop. Thank you for joining me once again on uh, today's journey uh, on my quest for wisdom. Uh, today I'm in Den Haag in uh, the Netherlands. And I definitely am bringing you um, two guests that I think you would find uh, tremendous wisdom in the choice they've made to uh, how to go through life. As you, uh, I don't often talk about it, but, uh, but, as, but as some of you may know that uh, I went uh, through a very interesting um, corporate life in my early years, end up, ended up being a chief business officer of Google X, which is like a fancy, fancy title for uh, someone that works in technology. And throughout that journey, I uh, had the joy of working with some of the most influential people on the planet, uh, whether business people, uh, you know, heads of states, sometimes royalty and so on. And you never see any of them uh, here on slow-mo, interestingly, uh, because uh, with all due respect, of course, uh, if they came to slow-mo, they will be talking about business and money and productivity and how you can push yourself harder and all of that stuff, which I have to say openly are not interesting topics for me, honestly. Uh, my attempt with slow-mo is to invite you to take some time to slow down and ref reflect on topics that really matter. And I think the topics that really uh, matter are uh, topics that are about us as humans, about what we can do to connect to ourselves, to others as humans. And I am hosted today at number five in Den Haag uh, by uh, uh, Princess uh, Laurenti Laurentine uh, and Prince uh, Constantine of the Netherlands. In my view, I'm a huge fanboy and I'll tell you why. Um, they really, really saw through the restrictiveness of royalty to shine as humans in my eyes. A true story, I'll tell you what how, how that started. Um, back in September when I published uh, Scary Smart, uh, Prince Constantine is very interested in artificial intelligence. And so my dear friend, Sonia Dippel, who is the uh, head of OneBillionHappy.org here in the Netherlands, uh, basically contacted Prince uh, Constantine and asked if he would want to have a conversation around artificial intelligence. Uh, I was visiting my dear friend, uh, Jimmy Nelson at his studio and then walks in somebody, like a normal person, honestly. If I wasn't told that he was the Prince of the Netherlands, I honestly wouldn't have felt any difference than just a wonderful human being walking in, had a wonderful conversation about artificial intelligence, about happiness, about things that really mattered. And then he, popped out of his seat and said, oh my God, my son is arriving at two o'clock in Den Haag. I need to go to rush back. He walks out of the studio, gets into a very normal car and just drives back himself. I stopped for a few minutes and I said, this is the prince of the country. And then I just thought to myself, okay, if, maybe it's because a weekend or something like that. Next week we were at Jimmy's uh, exhibition in France, uh, Jimmy's finale of his exhibition. And once again, Prince Constantine walks in with his uh, uh, wonderful uh, daughter, Leonor, and we were sitting on a crappy Moroccan restaurant somewhere, myself, Jimmy, and the team. And they just sat with us, shared the meal, laughed, then walked into the exhibition with 200,000 other people. I promise you, the room was filthy crowded, just like two of us. And uh, I became a fanboy. I started to honestly, uh, uh, um, you know, stalk you on the internet. Uh, then I ended up with videos of you going out 
uh, walking across tech conferences, just like one of us talking about technology and trying to help entrepreneurs. Then I saw videos of you in supermarkets, uh, driving your little blue Mini Cooper to go and uh, shop for normal, <laughs> normal stuff and cook it yourself. Then I stumbled upon Princess Laurentine and all of her, one of those. <laughs> all of her uh, constant attempt uh, to make the world a better place in child well-being, uh, you know, around the environment, the environment, literacy, uh, you know, empowering women and, you know, and minorities and so on, uh, writing children's books. And I'm like, okay, uh, that's not normally what I see uh, royalty do until I ended up with a, a, a um, quote that you said on your talk uh, um, when uh, on the Glo Global Kids Conference in Stockholm, which where you were really trying to push for children to be included in decision making, and you said the reason why we're not including children in decision making when they are supposed to be our future is because of our inability to be humbled. Now I have to say, when I heard that, I got it. I think both of you have got life, to be honest, because if ego is the underlying reason for all of unhappiness and wars and conflict in the world, then humbleness probably is the world, is the way to fix the world. And so I am sitting today with you, uh, royalty of the Netherlands, and I don't want to talk about royal stuff. I want to talk about humanity, if that's okay. First, first of all, thank you so much for having me. And thank you so much for being who you are. It really is I would say sometimes shocking to me, but it's definitely so refreshing to me to feel that you could make a choice that puts you in a place where your humanity shines more than your royalty. I want to start with the most pressing question that I had since I came here about this carpet. <laughs> I, what I need to understand <laughs> this, uh, if, if for those of us, if of you listening, uh, I have a very green looks like wet grass kind of carpet in the middle of the of the very refined you know old building that we're in what is this about uh, well it's it's, uh, it's actually our son who um, who has a little business and he used to uh, he used to go out and 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 buy um, kind of these uh, these drops drop products so this is a collaboration of IKEA and uh, off white for which he wanted us to uh, to post out of the IKEA store at six o'clock in the morning uh, to get uh, first in line to purchase whatever he could because he thought he could do a, a really good resale. <laughs> and uh, and actually, uh, uh, as it says, wet uh, wet grass, uh, then uh, Laurentine purchased it from him. So uh, oh. he, made a, he, he made a profit <laughs> and we got stuck with <laughs> the green grass, uh, the wet grass carpet. Yeah, and, and the reason, I think, the reason I purchased it from our son is that Wet grass, we all know that feeling of wet grass. Wonderful. And number five is all about people coming together, thinking as humans in order to solve issues of shared concern. So you have to decouple your human thinking and your functional uh, thinking. And so for people to come in and to be on a wet grass, you want them to almost think, they don't have to express it, <gasps> Oh, maybe I should have, I should take off my shoes. Oh, that's so, so nice. It kind of tickles the mind to say, oh, what's that? Wet grass. Yeah. So that's basically what I need to be informal. I need to be yes, human. Yes, I need to be human. I need to be myself, but without talking about it because then it's too much. So I thought it was just brilliant. Wet grass. Did, did, did you think he <laughs> knew that when he was buying it that you would actually... Definitely get... not. <laughs> <laughs> He's pretty um, hardcore on the... On making a good How business. old? He's now 18, but he was 15, I think. Yeah. Time. Yeah. Savvy businessman already. A very savvy businessman. Yes. He even made it to a Scottish entrepreneur, young entrepreneur of the year with his team. Oh, did he? He set up a, 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 a socks business. Okay. And um, yeah, good sustainable business, good socks business. business and, yeah. uh, which he now uh, discontinued and he's still, but he's still very much in, 
in in uh, sneakers, you know, selling and buying. Yeah, I, I am my daughter's in sneakers for yeah. sure. There, there seems to be something yes, in sneakers he's, he's, that he's I don't understand. Sneakers. So yeah. we are his logistics uh, back office. So, <laughs> so we get the, the yeah, you know, we get the orders, we get the slips, we get uh, you know, and I now want uh, five boxes of Nike, uh, these and these brands, these and these sizes. <laughs> Can you please package them? And then we have to print the labels, cut them out, you know. And, uh, bring them to our post office, which is... Has, a, has he considered his cost of labor? I mean, like he's hiring we, a we prince talked and about a princess. That. We talked yeah. about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He did first think of giving us a commission and we wanted to be good parents and say, well, we'll do this for free, <laughs> but we we have to reconsider by now. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's taken quite a bit of time and effort, right? <laughs> yeah, yes. I, I also have uh, noticed, if that's okay, that uh, Eloisa is quite popular on Instagram. So... You know, you appear to be on her uh, uh, page every now and then. And, you know, not a lot of young ladies have, um, you know, a prince and a princess to shoot in her Instagram. So how is that going? I think that we, it's kind of, you constantly have to have a balance between giving her the face, you know, it, it, she, she should do what she wants to do. But at the same time, we have our own considerations, each individually. And so she cannot evade in, in our privacy. Mm. So you, con you it's kind of a way to, to dialogue and say, okay, well, what do you want to share with the world? Um, uh, I'm not really on social media, so that's not my world. Um, it's fine. And I, and I admire her for doing what she does. But... Yeah, she has to realize that there are boundaries. So it's mm. really interesting to constantly have this kind of little conversations about that. Yeah. So 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 this is actually really where I I wanted to. So I just want to make just a, add one thing. So I'm I'm rarely on her uh, social media, but I think what is really important, and this is something we also discuss, we do discuss with her, and said, you know, if you want to do this, it has to be your story. So mm. in the moment that. Um, people want to use you to get to the royal stories, you know, stories about your uncle or about your grandmother or about, then uh, you'll never be your own, your own personality. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so she's taken that very, uh, very, very well and very seriously. Obviously she gets a lot of offers, uh, but she doesn't, uh, she doesn't want to uh, use her, her background. She's sometimes using the other way around. She's basically, I'm just a normal girl. Um, I deal with this, like everybody deals with their backgrounds, um, and I'm I do what I do, and I don't care if people judge me for for what I'm not. I just don't care, and I think what is what I admire in her is that she um, she she doesn't she really doesn't care. So if people talk badly about her and who don't know her, yeah, because they just don't know who she is, she, she says, well. How, and that's very much in line with your book. Uh, if, actually, she, she also read your book. She liked it. Yes. But, uh, and, but she was like this before she read the book. She says, you know, why would I care about somebody's opinion about me that doesn't know me? <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and, and, and she's, she's very uh, consistent in that, which I find I've, I don't have that in the same way that she has. So, well, so, so, so that's actually, so in, in my fanboy moments, I, I, as I follow the whole family, I find that it's actually quite interesting how you find that balance. The, the idea of, you know, she can be on Instagram, she can be herself, but there is a, the, there is a point at which you know that there is a, a bit of balance that is to be struck and you do that very well. And, and in my mind, I think, I, I don't know how to ask this, but there must have been a moment where either one of you or both of you said, we'd rather be human, just normal humans engaging in life. You know, we have the, I actually call it the burden of being royalty because it comes with a lot of responsibilities, a lot of restrictions. Most people don't realize that it's, you know, it, it is, uh, um, you know, it, it, it requires certain aspects of your life to be uh, governed and managed in certain ways, but you chose to live a very human life. You know, you're engaging in, in good good work for the world, engaging in trying to empower others. When did that happen? Was it always that way? Um, we, I think we both have our own story and, and obviously a shared story. I'm not sure it's really about a moment. I mm. think it's really more about a process and about a journey and about learning and about trying and then realizing that maybe this doesn't fit you. And um, I believe in the power of resistance. Mm. So by being who you are and doing what you do, you will always stumble upon resistance and people having different opinions. And then you have to realize with yourself, oh, oh what does it mean? Mm. So I think it's more about all these different elements 
kind of coming together along the way somewhere. And then you start to realize, okay, and then, yeah, trial and error. Mm -hmm. And then at some point, things start to click and, yeah, you evolve. So with my life, it's really been an evolution. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that for me, number five definitely has helped me find this neutral space where you invite people to step into a neutral space and also be themselves and start thinking properly as human beings. And that's really helped me as well. So it's, um, yeah, it's a journey. And for me, it, you become more and more perhaps who you were as a kid. Mm. So that's where I am, I think, rather oh, than a certain that's moment. That's a mega statement. So, we, so, so you feel that you are true to yourself yeah. as you were as a kid. I feel. Uh, oh wow! Yeah, I feel quite. Uh, I think that, that that's, aligned that's a that. dream for a lot of people, <laughs> especially if you don't mind me saying that uh, you know uh, you had a moment in your childhood or your teen, basically, where you had to go to Japan, which is I, I think for a teenager is a mega, mega shock. Like you, and especially Japanese culture and Dutch culture. So, so which of them is the kid? Which, which is the? How did that? change you? How did that shape you? So first, that was a choice that mm. I, uh, my parents gave me the choice to go with them or not oh. to go with them. Mm. And, um, uh, and I, I went with them. I guess I like adventure. Mm. Um, and um, so then I went there and indeed I, I came into and the Japanese environment, but also the French school that I chose mm. where I, my French was okay, but not really okay for a school um, setting. And um, yeah, so you're really down to you and feel very lonely and you feel sort of down and out. And then you realize that you have to make interventions and sometimes you plan them and very often you can't plan them and they happen, but you have to start recognizing them as an opportunity to make a connection with people because you're on your own. Mm. So you kind of make it happen. And um and I think you have to be alert to realize that there is signals around you the whole time that can help you in a new setting. But it's definitely been humbling, I think, there to be taken from when I was 16 from a hustling and bustling, you know, environment, lots of friends, suddenly being on your own and then having to get out of the rabbit hole. If you don't mind me saying, of course, with all respect to your highness, but these are normal human problems, you know, it's True. like, right. It's, I, I, I'm actually really interested to tell people that honestly, my, my, the reason I want the biggest learning I want our listeners to observe today is that, you know, you were the daughter of an important minister in the Netherlands. Uh, you know, you have a responsibility because of that, uh, you know, childhood, if you want. And you have the same sufferings that others suffer too. You're lonely, you need to make friends, you're in a different environment, you have to explore. There are things that you're uncertain about. You know, I, I don't know if people realize that. I don't, people, I don't know if people realize when they're looking at a TV screen where someone is walking on a red carpet that those are real issues. But interesting, maybe I can ask you, isn't that... It's strange that we find that so strange, isn't it? I know. <laughs> I, no, I, mean, know. I, I mean, I would say, you know, if you look at people like Elon Musk and, you know, yeah. they're only people. Exactly. Humans. So, uh, mm. and you can also tw uh, flip it. You can say, mm. you know, I mean, that, that anybody can be anything. Mm. Uh, obviously, with a lot of luck, maybe. And, 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 uh, but, um, and everybody is conditioned in some way. You know, we are maybe conditioned and, and yeah, I was born into this. So, I have every benefit I can get. You know, I'm I'm the most privileged person in the world, probably, um, and that comes with its own set of issues. You know, because then you have to, if you feel res maybe responsibility for things, or people expect you to do to do A, B, or C, and put you in a position where you're maybe remote, more remote from yourself. Mm -hmm. But that's not. It's just to, for you to overcome, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I I escaped to. Because you know, maybe this is good for you to know, but in the Netherlands, you you, you there's basically just the king and 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 the, the the queen mom and the 
a crown princess who gets paid by the state and the rest basically is, has to develop their own career. So mm. we are free to develop whatever we do. My, my brother was a, a, a banker and, uh, and then a CFO at a big, a big company. So he basically developed himself in that direction. And, um, and I worked in government and for, for consultancies. And so we basically, that's already a way to stay relatively normal because, mm. you know, you get your fee 60, Evaluation do in you? Booz Allen Hamilton, you know, no. you do, so you do. Of course, um, you have to learn about feedback, and you know that feedback is actually good so, for you. So there was someone at Booz Allen that actually sat you Everybody down. Everybody is three sixty, and, right? and didn't say your highness. And uh, well, I, I, I uh, hope not. So no, uh, no, no. So that, and I was in London, and then we went to Brussels. So we spent a lot of our time abroad, which makes it easier. Mm -hmm. Actually, for me, the big confrontation was coming back to the Netherlands. And then you have to kind of make a choice because in in Belgium, you know, we were. We were just normal citizens, and in the, here in the Netherlands, obviously, there's always this schizophrenic uh, situation where you have these these different different roles. Mm. And I think what it helps is just to choose, basically. So mm. you choose uh, for the role where you're spending most of your time, and the most of our time is just being normal people. And I love uh, that. And that's uh, and once you choose, it makes life much easier. I mean, then you go to the super supermarket, you drive your own car. Uh, and, and, but you, but and, you don't get interrupted by people, you know, wanting to take a selfie with you. And of course, but it's so. So I I see it. So I am actually in the way that I work and and the, the things that I do. I think it's a fallacy to. So we can we keep the system of you have functions and then you've got people. Mm. So I don't see. I yes. really love the, the 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 fluidity of people in their functions. Everyone should just be realizing, and that's the humility, to realize you're just normal, and you have a responsibility on top of that. So mm. the basis is everyone is human, and with one you put one function, and the other one you put another function. But, and that's what I wanted to ask you, saying, wouldn't life be much nicer if you, that's the starting point for everyone? And then we don't, ha we shouldn't ha make it so complicated <laughs> to start to be so surprised that, ooh, you've got people with a certain title who are normal. And I, my dream is to have a world where you can think properly, look at the environment and look at climate change. If our leaders realize my grandchildren are really the ones that I make the policy about and not separate in your mind, oh no, now I'm a head of state or now I'm a leader and now I'm a dad, then wow. decisions would be much better. Wow. So that is maybe why I'm kind of struggling with making it so special about us being normal people. I think it should that it, should be a given. Well, well, it, it's it's everyone's dream that this is reality, right? But it is not reality, unfortunately, in the world. I've I've worked with people who, you know, as soon as they bought their first BMW, thought that they were kings and queens, right? And, and I think the reality is that sadly, our world is in a place where it does that separation between system and human, where it does that separation between title and actual contribution. It does that separation between connection to the, to the reality of humanity and position within, mm -hmm. within humanity. And I think that's, uh, you know, that's, probably the opposite of how it, it, it should be in so many ways. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, so royalty is a special thing because it have, it, it's like the end of the ladder for mm. many people socially, but it's also just a role, right? So it's a role that you're, either bo you're born into, but you have to fill and you have to, and, and there's a whole set of mm. rules around it. And, and in a sense, that creates also a lot of space to do special things. You know, we are yes. not doing a lot of royalty stuff. Mm -hmm. So it actually created for us a lot of opportunities to do to do good things Stop because um, you, you, you get access. Yeah. And, um, but it is only just a role. But people associated with many more things. They think it's uh, it, there's the you know, Disney did a great job in marketing royalty as something you know the white horse and mm. and uh, and and something little girls aspire to with big dresses and all that, which um, which has its function. It mm. has its function. Maybe people like to dream and all that, but it's a role. So everybody in that role actually will have to kind of is, you, know, you know the people that are active royals are much more uh, confined than than we are. Mm. Um, and we can, we can, we sometimes step in and then we, we, you know, we get back to our, our real lives and work yeah. and, and we try to do it with respect for, for where we come from and respect for the institution and all that. Mm. But the, the underlying important value is we're doing this for, for people 
and you and if you can do that then that's a gift you know there are a lot of people that don't have the the space to be able to to work also for other people so it's it's a uh, i mean everybody gets as born with a, with a set of things and and yeah this is this is where we've been born well i've been born with and you kind of you, and you i just it. fell in love <laughs> yes. yeah it came yeah. with a yeah the nasty package of love yeah <laughs> can, can i ask as a child there must have been a moment where until that moment you were like just a child like playing around, not comprehending any of that. And then there is a moment where like, ooh, okay, I am not just a child, I'm a royal. Did, 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 do you re recall that at all? Yeah. What was that about? It was when my mother became queen. Uh -huh. And then what happened? Then... How, how old, by the way? I think when it was announced, I was uh, 10. Mm. Well, what happens is um, there's something of the innocence of the naivety kind of then disappears. And... And uh, people, or at least I felt, or you know, maybe it was true, people start looking at you and recognize you for for being something else than, than I was as a kid. Mm. So that definitely was a, was a defining moment, yeah. Okay, so love. Let's talk <laughs> about, exactly, let's yeah. talk about other things yeah. in life. <laughs> <laughs> love, T 2001, uh, if, I, if I may say, uh, even though I feel that you both uh, adopt a similar approach to how you want to do, do things, you're very committed, you take a logical approach, you're you're invested and so on. It seems that your interests are very different, right? So we have what's now quite a bit geeky now about artificial intelligence and technology and entrepreneurship and so on. And uh, you, uh, Princess Laurentine, you're constantly in, uh, you know, enabling humanity, enabling dialogue, enabling, you know, uh, um, communication, enabling empowerment for women, for children and so on and so forth. Uh, how do two people with such different agendas uh, fall in love. I'm sure that you have another answer, but <laughs> 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 so I think what there's a lot of things that connect us. I think values, but also I think the the I don't know the drive or the curiosity or to to challenge the status quo and to question, but we question in a different way, mm. and but we both question and and we are yeah. I think that, that that really is something that connects us. So I think that we, the work that we do, is there is much more alignment than you think there is. And I think it's always really about there are other ways to solve things or mm. there are other ways to do things. And looking at an issue, well, how come we don't solve it? Well, then you question the status quo. So we're both in this sort of disruptive mode, but in different areas, but we... Yeah, talk a lot about do you? Yeah, the kind of things that no, we do, and we recognize yeah. a lot of things yeah. with each other. Yeah, I think we are we are very very similar. Actually, mm -hmm. um, I think we both the common good is a really important driver. Mm -hmm. uh, we both are, as you say, disrupting. No, it's not about disrupting, but it's it's feeling that the conformity and you know the, the status quo is something that is, you know, and especially people that are. Defending conservatism, you know, is something we've, you know, we, I think we both find some sometimes really uneasy to to be with. And um, but I think the, our starting point is maybe different. Laurentine tends to start with the human, and I'm very much a systems person. But we are actually, it comes, it always connects somewhere. And I do think that to change systems, you have to start with the, with we have to start with people. So in the end, uh, we come together. But the, I think the natural you know, you naturally will be fearing towards the, the real connection with individual people and, yeah, and, and working and, that yeah. out. Whereas I tend to kind of go with the conceptual and then work my way down. It's like making a tunnel. So we, <laughs> you, yeah. and you need the system and the human, but you do need a certain logic from where you start digging the tunnel. Mm. And for me, it's always unraveling the story behind the story and individuals and looking at patterns what connect the stories and then little by little you start to realize ah but this is the underlying issue mm. so i work from the iceberg model and it's at the very bottom of the iceberg where you find the deep convictions and and all the issues that are blocking factors of the system and and i love delving deeper mm. um into that in the in the bottom of the iceberg. I, I'm a journalist by training, oh, and um, okay. I think so. That you're that, looking that for that, yeah. Yes. <laughs> what's underneath, and what's yeah. the why, and what's the story behind it? 
Yeah, so, so, so system logic versus people logic, I yeah. think, is yeah. uh, actually our favorite conversation, r r my favorite conversation before we started recording was the idea of how people make the system. And here in number five, what the whole idea is, we, you know, when I walked around, is to get people to sit in the right space where they become people and talk about the issues and talk about the topics. Can you tell me a bit about that? Yeah, it's really based on the idea, I think, of of dialogue and dialogue as a process to solve issues. Mm. So not to just talk about it, but to solve them. And David Bohm is really um, uh, an example of someone who really put into words, well, what is this process of dialogue and what do you need in order to solve an issue? And it starts, of course, with the problem definition. Mm -hmm. And then it immediately says, well, who defines the problem? And if only the ivory tower defines the problem, disconnected from the lives of people that the problem is about, be it poverty or people in debt or low literacy or whatever you have, you need to have the perspectives of the people concerned in order to really understand what the real issue is. Otherwise, the people from the ivory tower will only see the tip of the iceberg mm. and you start solving the wrong problems and you see it happening the whole time. So in order to understand at source what is the real issue, you have to have a dialogue of equal mind, where you actually be, I'm the one who will then help facilitate that all, everyone is equal, where everyone gets on the wet on the grass, wet grass yeah. and becomes human. No one is fully right and no one is fully wrong. Beautiful. And then immediately you start saying, oh, well, wait a minute, this is the problem. And then from there, you start to actually de de design a process with the people concerned to start solving the right issues. So it's actually a very fluid and yet very mathematical process. Mm. I'm not at all into mathematics, but it's a very analytical process, but from the softness of perspectives rather than the harshness of positions. And if you, then suddenly the truth appears together and um, everything becomes easier. So... S sort of leave your ego outside the door, basically. So totally. if you if, if you walk into number five, it yeah. doesn't matter if you're a head of state or if you're a, the, the person affected by the by the challenge. You, yeah, everyone's you, equal. Everyone yeah. is equal. Yeah, and you need that. And exactly as you say, so some people you need to uh, lift the ego up because they have had a yeah. life where they've been they were, constantly not heard and not understood and so on but their perspectives are really interesting. And with others, you just have to level the ego. So in the end, number five is one sort of ego management p space. <laughs> and, and it's lovely because everyone gets happy because mm. yeah, everyone gets empowered one way or another. And you start to really design the right processes. And um, yeah, you see it really working like that. It's it's hard because you have to, you stumble upon resistance of egos and, and convictions and patterns. And yeah, through softness, a lot of things can happen. That's incredible. What did I tell you guys about wisdom? So I, 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 I see that the power here is that you use what you apply to your own personal life, which again, royalty is an ego. You leave the ego, you engage, you get things done and you bring that here. And, and I want to start talking about work, if you don't mind, if, if we're okay with that. So, Is so, that separate for you? It doesn't sound like it. It's not for me, no. no. For me, for me, my, my life now is one, yes. one big blurry unit. Yes, of sir, everything. same here. Yes, yeah, right? very yeah. blurry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, there is so much that you do, but I think each of them requires a bit of our attention. So, chi you know, uh, the, um, child well-being, for example. Uh, women empowerment, minority empowerment, and so on, uh, and and lots of the projects that you you do uh, around you know in the environment, around connectivity, around dialogue, the law, the work that you do, uh, Prince Constantine, Constantine on uh, empowering entrepreneurship, and so on. So, where do we want to begin? What do you want to ask? What do you want to pick? Uh, I want to maybe something deeper than just themes. Um, I, I I I I'm actually quite interested in the common theme across all of them. You seem to be very, very, very future focused. It's like, and I, if, I, if I follow your work reasonably, you're between 
there's something very wrong right now, such as the recent, uh, you know, scandal that happened in uh, in the um, in the Netherlands. But you also always go back and say, it's not that I just want to fix it now. I want to make sure that it doesn't happen again. So you're constantly saying, if I don't mind, say, if I understood correctly, the future can be better than where we're heading. Mm. Right. So, so let, let's take the example of that. You know, maybe share with our listeners a little uh, about what had what had happened, and you know, the approach you're taking to uh, the issue of I don't know what it's called, the discrimination maybe against a few minorities and so on. Yeah, it's a scandal around childcare benefits um, uh, in in the Netherlands. So, I think in essence, trying to get the concept right rather than the facts of the situation is that. It's really ultimately solving issues always has to do about who is in power and who is the subject of the decisions. Mm. And when you've got this situation here of the government for many years, telling, making people seemingly fraudulent, but they weren't actually committing fraud from the child care system. So the government admitted and saying we were wrong. It's in profiling, yeah. Mm. In profiling people and 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 so on. Um, so, if the government then wants to solve the issue for the people concerned, the government is the wrongdoer. Mm. So the wrongdoer cannot really be the credible one to make the solutions. Mm. But the wrongdoer, in this case, the government, feels responsible for getting it right because they were guilty. And they admitted that they were guilty. And then if you admit that you were guilty, of, you want to put it right. Mm. Because they're also good people. Mm. Everyone in the end is good, are good, good people. But in the perception and the belief of the people concerned, obviously the government in this case was the wrong who put their lives in misery for 15 years. So the government has to realize, ah, but wait a minute, I am not the one. I need to be humble. I cannot be the one to be the one to be driving the processes for change, I have to give the autonomy um, uh, and the control of the lives back to the people concerned. Mm. And so the role that I take is in deep listening, understanding that the deepest problem you need to solve is the injustice that was done to them, that the control of the lives were taken away, and that the financial issues are consequences of that. So the tip of the iceberg is the financial consequences, what we see, people lost their lives, uh, people lost their homes, people ha had children taken away out of their homes, misery, but much deeper is the deep sense of injustice that was done to them. Mm. And so what you then need to do is, is to rearrange the relationship between the wrongdoer and the victim wow. and the system will always be defensive of its actions and saying but we're doing the right thing but they have to realize that the people concerned are really the ones yeah who have the right to say well listen you're not the one to organize the assistance now because where were you all these 15 years mm. so it's a very fundamental shift in yeah power relationship basically and you have to slowly move it uh, towards equality but we're making progress it's actually starting to happen in a number of cities the local government has started to realize wait a minute we cannot be the ones coming up with the solutions because we are we are the ones who did wrong you're not co-creating it with and so we're co-creating and and all i do is the deep listener and the the kind of facilitator of the thinking and the of the people concerned, so children and young people and 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 parents. And um, yeah, we're slow. It's really wonderful to see that slowly justice is coming back because yeah, because the 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 the, the victims are starting to be heard in the right way and taken seriously. And it's very sad, perhaps, that they need somebody with a with my stature or function or title, whatever you want to have it, to be heard. And I mm. ma it makes me uncomfortable sometimes. Mm. Why am I needed? And and yeah, because they, these people have absolutely, they have wisdom. If you talk about wisdom, wisdom through life, wisdom through understanding the system, they survive despite everything. And it makes me very humble. And so perhaps maybe the lesson out of this is, can we please start looking 
at other people for wisdom than the ones usually on top of the iceberg. Oh, wow. That's, yeah, it's very, it's a bit conceptual. I hope that listeners understand, but um, we have to start looking at other wisdom and, and taking that seriously. I mean, there, there are so many layers of emotion in this. And, and I, have to, I have to say I'm, I'm silenced because I'm external to this story. But I, I believe that your, your attempt is much more dignified than the typical capitalist attempt, if you want. In a, in a typical capitalist world, if you know, the victims were um, suffered damages, we would just go and say, okay, so how much are the damages? Here is a you know, a $200 million fund, we're going to fix the damage, right? But what you're saying is that the damage is not fixed with that. The damage is is, is really much, much deeper in the yeah. connection and the human ability to get anything done between them. Because yes, you can give me back money, but how about how I feel? How about what went away? Well, you know, what 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 is uncompensatable by money? That's a very different place. I think, yeah, you're absolutely right. And you... I mean, I think the deepest dignity that was taken away is that they were not recognized as equal citizens, as people who had, and, and in the end, the deepest uh, desire that we all have as human beings is to be recognized as human beings. And so therefore, just looking at people as victims is not bringing back that dignity. And you just have to connect understand and respect and and feel them and say wow and i'm in awe mm. with what they went through but i will not cry with them because they're not going to get that life back i i think the deepest respect is that they deserve us to be respectful and saying my goodness are you wise or what mm. and that is being recognized and the rest will follow from that and that's that turn of 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 relationship is is what I really believe in, and yeah, it's um, amazing. Yeah, Prince Constantine, from from the, the systems point of view, we also discussed a little bit. That's interestingly, even though the mistakes happened, uh, they were not deliberate attempts to be against someone. It's that just that the system went out of no. yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, so, so just for our listeners who may not be aware, basically the system uh, would would tend to profile certain people benefiting from childcare benefits uh, in ways that are slightly different than others. That was the, the, the beginning of the crisis. But well, no, I think the the there's just the general thing is in the, in the Netherlands we try to help people when when they are run into problems so there's a whole elaborate social welfare system that will 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 also be looking after exemptions and try to find a, a, a way to support people that are you know that fall uh, between the cracks so it's it is extremely elaborate uh, but it also becomes complicated and once you get complexity then you start making mistakes and then uh, and this is what happens so people uh, maybe made mistakes and it was misunderstood for fraud and um, and and the government also comes is 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 asked also by the parliament and by other instances. You know, you have to look after taxpayers' money. So if this goes, you know, if 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 there is fraud or if there are mistakes and the money is is doesn't arrive at the right people or it's a, it's misused, you know, the government has a has a responsibility to act. So mm -hmm. it's just in the way how it acted, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it it turned out that they were um, punishing people uh, and and completely um, disproportionately and uh, and that suffering was not acknowledged for for many years and and that's what so actually basically what you're seeing is that it's a system or a bureaucracy doing what it what it is set up to do um, but there's very dis very little discretionary uh, power in the system so that people uh, there's no one there that can say stop and no mm. one that can say you know or that there's no empathy in the system mm. And um, and that means that you know people that are that are asking for empathy because saying this can't be done to me this is not fair, and the system will tell you well that's the system you made a mistake and this is where we're going down this route, and it's very unforgiving and I think with hindsight we're saying you know, why didn't people stop this and uh, why didn't the parliament do something or why didn't that or why didn't the the the, the judges and, or the and uh, or the civil servants it's because everybody has a little slice of the pie and. and and nobody has the full overview and nobody takes uh, is accountable for the AO for just for that little bit, yeah. Yeah. but not for the outcome. Mm. 
Mm. And I think this is, I think, one of the things is that, you know, also what, what Laurentine keeps doing is like, there is an outcome of all of this. And you have to look what that is, you know, what is the result of, of all of these little steps? If that result, all the little steps can be fine, but if the result is bad, then someone needs to be, you know, look at this and say, you know, oh, this we have to stop. You know, mm. something has to change. And I think it's to add to that, I think <clears throat> all of in, in whatever system, if a system is fragmented, you can never see patterns. If you stop seeing patterns where you say, well, wait a minute, we now have individual X and Y and so on and having similar issues where, for example, in where many people suffered from where they had um um you know, they had a little bit of they owed a bit of money and then suddenly it became, I don't know, 20,000 euro. Mm. The discrepancy between something that was 100 euro and then suddenly 20,000, a judge should have said, well, wait a minute, that's weird. Mm. But one case, you think, okay, it's fine. If that judge would have seen 10 cases, you start to get signals and saying something's not right here. So I, what I'm really deeply puzzled about is why do we not see individuals and individual cases as N is one, as is that all okay? But it's only until we see ten in a row, then we suddenly say, "Ooh, there's a there's some there's a real problem." Mm. And what I think my drive is that, and where I think also in the government, a lot of different also government agencies are starting to work towards, is to make the government human again. Yes, and to start realizing that every case can be a signal to learn how about real lives and to start understanding that even one case can give you a pattern of where somewhere the system perhaps has not um uh, is not doing is not, not getting not the overview yeah. and not mm. performing mm. and that where what you're rightly saying where the complexity of the rules that one rule is going against another rule or another policy where it actually gets people into trouble so i think that we're coming into a time where we need to start looking at that and the hope is that indeed and i'm working with an, also a number of government agencies where they're really serious about trying to get this right it actually comes back to your, your the word humble mm. uh, because if you assume the system is right and so this is, was very much in the system and also it's a bit in the dutch nature you know this you know this couldn't have happened here you know they would say you know in a country like the netherlands where everything is so organized you know this cannot happen well if that's your basic assumption then it's always going to be n is 1 but mm. if you say n is 1 how did this happen? This and it's actually, if I'm hum more humble and and I say, well, it could be that we as a government or as a system, or we are, we're not perfect. There might be something, and it might be a one-off, but it might actually be a pattern. So, and it's when when you start bringing this empathy back in, or you, basically humanity back into system, then then there are there should be more people that at a certain point say, wait a minute, is this a signal? Or is it just a one-off case? And if you think it's a signal, then uh, there has to be authority to act. Mm. And that I think is where, where it's been lacking, but I think is we, we, well, we should be working towards that. But that's across anything. I think if you are a CEO, you have the same thing. You know, you, you're too far remote from the work floor. And if you hear things, if a client, if one client at a, at a drinks party you know, tells you, you know, I got some really bad service from your company, um, you should take, yeah, you should take should, there's should, so many so few people that will give you feedback anyway yeah. uh, so if you get feedback don't be defensive and say yeah. you know that can't happen in my company because we are the best yeah no and don't don't say but you know 99.99 others are okay i think that yeah. this is the problem yeah. with the mathematics yeah. really is that you're you know when you, when you try to look at the fitting line of multiple points and one of them is very very different like it we normally mathematicians will say it's a mistake so ignore that result and just yeah, yeah, yeah. have the fitting line between the other results and it's yeah. working fine while people who are actually looking at systems and analysis should say yeah but it is it is a very significant case for that one dot yeah. that one dot really suffered and can i and look i think at that? yeah and yeah. i think that the drive has been on scale 
Um, yes. We've been putting in management KPIs of outcomes and so on, where we we where, for example, people wanting to help people, they don't have the time to actually listen properly. Mm. So if you don't listen properly and you think, I kind of hear the story, you want to hear the story within your frame of mind. And then that frame doesn't, the story doesn't fit your frame. And then you say, okay, it's, then you mm. get into what Constantine is saying. Then you say, well, of course we're right because you're in a hurry. So the slowing down of the slow-mo, <laughs> I love, because that's what you need. And But we need to get the right protocols in order to get everybody in a row to start working that way. And if you're always looking at scale or large groups, whereas the lives of individuals are individual lives, then you can see how one doesn't fit with the other because one is looking at groups and the other one is looking at individuals. Mm. So you really have, and, and I'm a, you know, call me crazy perhaps, I think you can actually build systems from here. And I think this scandal will help give us the urgency of drawing lessons from it in order to design systems differently. And mm. I, ha I am hopeful um, uh, that it, it, yeah, it can work that way. And I think, um, so now I'm going to be, the f I'm going to flip, you are now on systems, I'm on the individual. I think what at least works for me is when I, when I feel that I get defensive, because I also get defended. You know, if somebody criticizes my my organization or something, you know, the, there can be this reaction. I say, you know, it can't be true. You know? mm -hmm. That is such a flag. You know, and yeah. for everybody, that should be a flag. So if, yeah. if, if you get defensive, then immediately you should, you should somewhere, you know, you should, you should write down, okay, this is something I need, I need to, work to be aware. Why am I defensive about this? Mm. It's, and it is always an underlying thing. It's an underlying insecurity or there's something, uh, but that's when you have to watch it. So mm. if the government, when they get defensive about something, then it's because they don't have authority. Mm. Because if you get defensive, you say, well, wait, I don't really know. You know, if you're fully aware of what's going on, you don't have to get defensive. You have the answer and you can, you can be comfortable and, uh, with, you know, with, with taking criticism. Yeah. Um, but if you don't, then, and, and so, so that's a red flag. So, and I think what you're saying, actually, it's really about the autonomy of mind. And it's really about um, uh, why do people get offensive? Because maybe they're fearful that their boss, they are giving them the wrong KPIs. Mm. And then they kind of say, oh, but then my boss might think that I'm wrong. Mm. But I believe that in the end, if you connect again, people are defensive in the end. You're, you're kind of saying, I think, because maybe their moral compass is telling them that something is wrong, but they try and sort of, sort of make it, make it, I don't know, smaller and, and making it disappear because they're afraid that they might be, I don't know, seen as ignorant and so on. I'm a great believer in ignorance. Uh -huh. What does that what mean? mean? What do you mean? I'm a great believer in saying, you know what? I don't know. Because if you don't know, you're going to ask a question. Okay, well, what is it that you don't know? So we're constantly driving people on what they know instead of what they don't know. And if you're driving your people in your team or in your organization or to say, actually, you know what, look within yourself what you don't know, you're actually making people that curious kid again, because that was the kid that didn't know and didn't have all the answers. So I think that people who have the answers, they will always defend all the answers that they have, whereas mm. the people who don't have the answers and who don't know, they're the ones who have the questions. And that's where I think the real wisdom lies. But we have to start building our teams, actually saying, you know what, go and look for within yourself what you don't know. And that is where you become very humble. And so me working with the parents or the children or or it's if I co I'm constantly forced to say, I don't have the wisdom. I just have to listen for the wisdom and start looking at patterns. And I tell you, it's a very happy place to be because mm. suddenly I don't need to be the one who knows it all, but it's like a revelation. You actually start to be the one to start to say, oh, but wait a minute. Wow, that was great. But how what, How about the one puzzle? I'm the, I'm the making the one who makes the jigsaw puzzle. So I start to say your wisdom and your wisdom and your wisdom together makes a full picture. So I don't need to have the individual wisdom. You, you don't feel the need like 
a rhetorical question. Princess Laurentine, you don't, you don't, you don't feel the need to tell someone, but I know and you don't, and I'm going to tell you everything because I'm the boss here. Not at all. Oh That's a very God, unhappy a, place to be. I know, because then you have to defend it for the rest of your life. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You, 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 keep, you keep talking about listening. Hmm. What, what is listening? What is listening? Very good question. It's a strange word. To listen is to kind of hear, okay, this is going to sound really sort of spooky and, and sort of our son calls me spiritual. I'm not spiritual. Um, I don't know what spiritual is actually, um, but he jokes with me about it. Um, I think listening is to hearing words in the way that they're used, but also hearing the words that are not used. Ooh. So in between the words, I kind of hear words that are not there. Not said, but... And not said, but they're kind of... Exist within. Exist, and you kind of feel that people are holding back and they make choices to use certain words and words have to do, do with, deal with relationships. So, for example, in the work that I do, um, the system people will talk about saying, ah, we have to, um, uh, we have to use people's input for the things that we do. And I say, okay, that means that you are the owner and you're the boss and their input you use for mm -hmm. them. So there is a lot of, there's a universe in that sentence. Wow. And then I start to see it saying, ah, okay, that means that you think that you're uh, you're, you're above God them. and they're coming in to give you some input. Yes. Okay, so that's not equal. Mm -hmm. So my basic thing is about equality. Okay, well then we have to start unraveling what you've just said. I'm going to be very careful when I speak around <laughs> you. you. You better. <laughs> I mean, in an interesting way, it's, this is something we use a lot in technology now with pattern recognition and contextual recognition of things like translation and so on. It's because there are omissions that are as valuable as, mm. uh, you know, inclusion. So you can sometimes say things and you understand something, but if you're missing a word, you understand something very different. Yeah. And, you know, if that word is said with an intention that basically positions them, as you just said, it's quite, uh, quite interesting. C can I go to that for a, for a bit, like techie prints? Uh, <laughs> so so you're, you're very, very um, committed to the mission of more entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and you're, a, a big believer uh, in tech and maybe a bit of AI as a part of that. Why is that? I don't believe in tech. Mm, you don't? No. Okay. I, yeah. I, I, I believe in human ingenuity mm -hmm. and in innovation. And I, I see how a lot of that is not actually making it into society, into the market because of all kinds of, you know, problems. Mm. You know, there might not be capital, there might not be talent, or there might not be, you know, there might be rules that stop that from happening. So that's what concerns me. Mm. Um, and I see people that are struggling to bring an idea to life. And I think you know everybody should be enabled to get those ideas into the world. Uh, and then of course, there are things that we don't want in society to happen. And then there are, you know, there are governments that set rules. And, and so, so it's not that every entrepreneur can do whatever they want. But I do think that um, uh, society is better off if we have people that are curious and that that curiosity gets a space and that you can get actually to to develop your your dreams and uh, and i think that's entrepreneurship mm. so, so this is what tech leap does it, it tries to well work. tech leap is 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 funded by the government so the government uh fundamentally believes that what we do is the, is right otherwise they wouldn't pay for us at least that's what i what i think we are an independent foundation um but the underlying idea is that uh there, there are many global challenges. We have many challenges for the Netherlands and, uh, and we need um, innovations, new companies, technologies to, to deal with those. And those companies will not, or those technologies will not have any impact if they don't somehow find their way into society or into the market. Mm. And, uh, and startups are the vehicle to bring those uh, those idea to market, so that's basically how I came to it. And if you then <coughs> you then start to dig into that, you start looking at like what's holding people back and what do you need, and then you know you can you can venture out into all kinds of things. And, it, and in the end, it comes down to you know uh, 
do we have sufficient density of entrepreneurial communities where those entrepreneurs are supporting each other, they're investing in each other, they're helping each other. And you really don't need much of a government. The government needs to kind of step back, you know, mm. educate people, set the right rules, and then let most of that happen. And then, of course, look at, you know, at things that you've been writing about. Also, when that entrepreneurial system starts to develop things that are not desirable, that you are you know, well informed and that you can actually regulate. Um, mm. um, so that's basically the context in which I'm working. Which is incredible. Again, I mean, uh, even though you talk about technology, I think there's that constant underlying bit of people, people, people. Let's enable people yeah. to do that. Let's, let's take government out of the way if it's the, uh, stopping in the way and so on and so forth. Now, government is, can be an incredible force for good. can also be an incredible force of you know, bureaucracy and just strain. It can be forced for bad, like everything, like technology. And uh, so, but government needs to know the technology and know, you know, where it works well and where it doesn't. Uh, it needs to understand, you know, how you interact with the market so that the market can do good things. Mm. And uh, and we don't, we're not always like that. Governments sometimes kind of make, are very obstructive to ideas coming up because those ideas might change the sitting order. Mm. And uh, we tend to like to defend uh, the sitting order. Whereas uh, maybe that's just something we have in common. I think you pointed out already is that, we believe that the sitting order is not is not ultimately the the best, the, the best space, um, yeah. and and that there is improvement, and that improvement, you know, we should seek that. And I think that you're also addressing another important issue that I think connects us is this notion of systemic change, where you should always look at the integrality of things and the connectedness. So it's interesting when I keep hearing the word human. And I think, yeah, but what about the environment? Mm. And uh, very often these two issues are disconnected from each other. And, and that's where things go wrong. And because systems are designed to be fragmented, that's when things go wrong. Because then you start very to wrong. say, we're going to fix this for humans. Well, And that's how our whole system got developed. And saying, oh, yeah, the environment is kind of an afterthought. Mm. Whereas, well, we shouldn't be turning things around and we start looking at the integrality. And we sometimes have discussions about, okay, is fine, for example, on technological innovations, but are we actually doing the right thing in the bigger scheme of things? So is, is it tech for good or is it tech to make us lazy and uh, obese and unhealthy and not getting off from our couch or is it that we develop uh, um, I don't know technology where we stop interacting and talking to each other so we lose empathy uh, yeah, I, 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 I love the project that you did at uh, the airport at Schiphol the, I mean there was a video online about people uh, yeah. actually playing b yes. board games yeah. I love that I mean yeah. you look at for example I'm a big fan of, of Sherry Turkle's book um, mm. uh, Rejoin, Rejoin, Reclaiming Conversation The Power of Talk in a Digital Age where she clearly talks about a power of a, a crisis of empathy we're in mm. and the moment you're in a crisis of empathy on a scale we're constantly at war we're gonna f we're not gonna understand each other anymore so I think we should have to realize in whatever we do and whatever innovation there is, you should always remember the bigger scheme of things and the integrality of things. So interesting when I keep hearing the word human, I'm like, yep, yeah, human, but in the scheme of the environment. Mm. Let's not forget. Mm. We're not mm. super. All of, all of yeah. being combined, all of being as yes. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, Princess Laurentine, uh, you, 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 um, you told me the story that when you were uh, 18 or maybe 18 years ago, uh, you had to tell someone. It was about the same, 18 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, I, th I thought 18 no, years no, ago I'm she was kidding. 10. He's kidding. Oh, okay, He's sorry. kidding. <laughs> ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> now you're pushing it. No, 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 come on. <laughs> come on, let it pass. <laughs> so, um, uh, that you had to push back on, uh, on, on someone to say, I choose to live a happy life. Mm. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I, I always try to have uh, a bit of conversation around happiness at the end of, uh, of every podcast. So maybe share the story and, and tell me what happiness is. What are your biggest tips for happiness? Ooh. So, yeah, the, basically the story was that I was writing my first uh, Mr. Finney book. Yes, we didn't talk about Mr. Finney. Yeah, tell me fine, about Mr. Finney. Fine, yes. I like him. 
thanks. <laughs> you can have him, this little, <laughs> little stuffed animal. Um, so Mr. Finney, I think is kind of an alter ego and it was a I way know. to get a voice uh, out there, but tentatively. So inside a character, which is always more comfortable because it, then it's not about me, but it's really about the character. And I was developed, I, I wrote the books and amazingly illustrated by my deep friend who is no longer with us, C. Postuma. And he's a character that basically discovers the world by asking questions mm. and coming to the truth and wisdom through questioning. And mm. um, so there's a lot of me, a lot of myself in him. And, um, and then somebody actually said, gave me all the reasons why I shouldn't be doing that. And I told that person, well, you know what? I plan to have a happy life. And um, this is what I wanted to do. Mm. And so giving people pushback, especially people who you love, is not always easy, but you have to choose for that. And I think that sentence kind of came out of my mouth, I guess, because it came from very deep from within that that is ultimately who I am. Um, and actually saying, stop, you have entered my feeling of autonomy and uh, I'm willing to go a long way to accommodate other ways, but this is what I need for myself. And um, so I guess happiness is that you dare to be align find alignment between the values that you hold and the things that you do and the way that you relate yourself to the world around you, not above anything, but also not below anything. Mm. So it's kind of, I guess, happiness is kind of alignment for me. Amazing. For you, Prince Constantine. It's a difficult question. You know, what is happiness? No, what is your happiness? What is my happiness? <laughs> when am I happy? Um, so happiness is in somehow it is a comfort thing in there. You know, I can be happy if I'm comfortable, but I was always a bit more happy when it's when it's in motion and when I know things are, I can actually contribute to something. So, I'm um, if it's stagnant, I'm I don't I'm not I can be happy in the moment, but I feel there's I'm comfortable uncomfortable. So I need to. Um, I, I'm, I'm happiest when I feel that I'm doing stuff that I really can contribute to. And, uh, um, but um, also, and I think I'm growing um, also, I think, as an individual every day and um, um, also by understanding much better uh, how other people, uh, how, they, how people tick and how every person has these kind of deep, deep underlaying issues and, and everybody, or we're just living together in a world where we see like a little bit of each other, maybe the top of this iceberg. And, uh, and we don't know what lays behind. And I find that I'm also through Laurentine kind of, I, I am exploring much more now, you know, what is, what is behind that? And, you know, and also in my company, the whole, you know, the whole discussions around inclusiveness and, and diversity are, are extremely profound and uh, and helpful also to understand much better also myself mm -hmm. um, you know where am i coming from why am i why am i suddenly you know extremely impatient it's my absolute worst worst character trait and i would and if i see to my kids i tell them don't go there you know, <laughs> you know i don't know how to get rid of it i'm impatient and it, it's i just i really do not like it i would like to be a much more patient person mm -hmm. and 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 i this is when i really think if i get impatient i, I just wonder where does, does that come from mm -hmm. and then i'm not happy so i'm trying and i'm feeling that i'm I'm becoming more patient, and, I'm, and it's make me it makes me happier. Yeah, and, age, uh, age helps a lot. I can I can assure it's you. No, that. it's not. <laughs> it's a point in time when you go like, think, yeah, I don't think it's do. I don't think it's age. I think it takes uh, it takes work. Uh -huh, absolutely. And I think it yeah. takes. Um, it also means um, because why am I? You know, why do I get excited about something? That's it's a very it's, interesting question. Um, and as, you know, in the positive sense, but also especially in the negative sense, why does that happen? And then. I think in your book, you write something about uh, the kids crying in the airplane. 
Uh, mm. And then why would that upset you? You know, why, you know, who cares? You know, as a kid crying, you know, of course I can't sleep maybe, but th that this kind of takes you back to a deeper self where you, you know, maybe you're a youth or, um, and, and to understand, you know, you know, when I get, when you get upset, you know, to understand, you know, that this is really something that the voice in your head is telling you mm. and, uh, and that you can overcome that. Uh, that's a, that's a happy moment when you start thinking, okay, you know, I understand where this comes from and I, and I can actually start dealing with it. And I think maybe to, to just add to that, I think happiness, I was just, when I was listening to you, I think happiness is when you can, you have the peace of mind to bring up images beyond the current situation with, that you're in. So if you have the peace of mind to take you to your own imagination, so being in an airplane with crying kids and you're trying to sleep and that you somewhere find a peace of mind that takes you out of that situation and maybe you're kind of imagining yourself somewhere else, then suddenly the crying kids become a completely irrelevant fact yeah. and that you're somewhere else. So while I was listening, I think it kind of, I realized sort of maybe happiness is is helping, is, is when you're able to use your imagination again and float out of the situation a bit, or to have the imagination to be in the situation. So mm. to start and see seeing, what's good with it, yeah. ah, this is a good place to be in, and oh, this is not a good place to be, and I want to be in another place, and then allowing yourself to draw that image. And I'm a great believer that you can actually steer your mind. And I've actually done that. Um, uh, thanks to a neuropsychologist who I, who I asked when I was unhappy about, very, very deeply unhappy about something, about feeling not included in my flock. Mm. And she started, I said, I want to explain my, I want to understand my brain in order to get to another place because I have my, I plan to have a happy life. Mm. And this is going against that. And then when she said, and I said, can I actually create a flock in my own mind where I am happy. And she said, absolutely. And then for three months, invisible to anyone, I just imagined, kept on imagining my flock. What, what makes me happy? What makes me happy? And now my, my mind believes in this mm. and I have my happy space. Mm. And it's such, a, it's such a richness. I'm so grateful that somehow my mind has allowed me to, to have that. And that's, I guess, what yeah, imagination does and, and why writing, I love writing yes. because you can just make words appear on page. He can, he's, he makes great drawings. I, I like words. He, he also uses words, but yeah, I think imagination will helps a lot in creating happiness. Yeah. It's allow, it's allowing the brain to, uh, to find a different space than where it wants to stay and nag. Yes. Right. Yeah. 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 yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I like yeah. the word now. Yeah. 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 Well, happiness for me has been this honor of an incredible conversation with your smiles, with your humbleness, with your uh, very, 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 very wise words. Uh, I know you don't like me to say that, but I have to say, uh, blew me away. I think humbleness, humility, leave the ego outside, be human, listen, seem to be a superpower. Actually, mm -hmm. I'm witnessing it uh, as we speak. So I'm very, very grateful for your time, very grateful for your hospitality, very grateful for your humanity, for believing that we can do better in the world. Thank you for being here. Thanks. I, 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 it's been wonderful, I think, with your questions, sort of shaping your thoughts and giving it words and, and actually doing this together, which we don't do very often. We never do We this. never do this. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> no, we don't. So yeah. it's, uh, it's been great sitting here I, and having yeah. these kind of conversations I think, together. I think you, you, do, you do amazingly together, so you should, you should <laughs> well, do that very that's often. That's good after 21 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, yeah. yeah, Thank you so much for having me and for everyone listening. I don't know what to tell you other than, uh, first of all, seek wisdom everywhere because uh, sometimes wisdom comes from the lives that are different than yours. And I have to say that approach to humbleness uh, just shines in everything around me from the uh, wet grass carpet to every word that has been 
uh, said here, it has definitely been one of my favorite conversations. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. So go do what you have to do. Click five stars and tell everyone in the world around it and so on. Uh, but while you do that, I think uh, there was so much to learn uh, in this conversation today about how what life gives you should never define how you're going to go through your life. I think the choice of how you uh, can find a happy life can be so hidden in places that are uh, are are very different than from than the point from which you began. So why don't you just take a few hours this week to consider that, to consider where your life is and how you will choose to have a happy life. Yeah, and it doesn't matter how busy you are this week. I think you will always find a few hours to slow down. I love you all for listening and I see you next time.